happy to uh, introduce Nicole von Gurmanton today, a scholar who's doing some very interesting archival work on social norms and patterns in early Spanish colonial life uh, in the Americas. Uh, Nicole joined the history faculty in 2003 after completing her doctoral work in history at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, more recently, she's had a, an appointment as a visiting scholar at uh, Stanford Center for Latin American Studies. That was from 2008 to 2010. Her first book, Black Blood Brothers, Confraternities and Social Mobility for Afro-Mexicans, was published in 2006 by uh, the University of Florida Press, and she followed this soon after with a translation and commentary, a uh, treatise on slavery, of an important 1627 uh, Latin American work on slavery. Um, last year, uh, her latest book, Violent Delights, Violent Ends, Race, Sex, and Honor in Colonial Cartagena was published by the University of New Mexico Press. All of these works open the colonial world of Latin America for closer examination uh, than we've had before and focus less on those in power uh, than those uh, in the experience of living under colonial rule. Her talk today extends that work with a study based on painstaking archival research of the cultural place and legal status of sex work in the earliest period of Spanish government in South America. And I got a little uh, look at the images of the archival documents that Nicole's been working on. Uh, they're very interesting and they really get some uh, thinking going about what the digital age opens up to us, but what it's still not quite available uh, in uh, that, that what, what needs to be added to that kind of archival uh, research. Uh, her study is opening, opening up uh, new perspectives on this foundational period in the history of colonized, the colonized Western Hemisphere, and I'm pleased to welcome Nicole von Gurm to this. And also, thank you everyone for coming. I know there's 15 talks on campus today, so I really appreciate coming out. <laughs> I'm honored that um, you chose this one to attend. It really is nice. I, I know I skip a lot of talks. <laughs> it's really hard to motivate the ones to come out. So um, I'm here to work on a uh, this is my um, previous book that came out last year. Um, I'm working on a new book um, that continues this previous work that I work, did on gender, sexuality, honor, and Span Spanish uh, vice regal justice. So uh, just a little ad there. <laughs> I keep very close track of my Amazon. Uh, <laughs> and so here's my uh, working title. Um, this is a, a very tentative title because it's very difficult to get the proper um, terminology. Um, I have to avoid the word prostitution in order, other than to quote cases from the 1700s forward when courts and litigators began to use this term. So sometimes I use the term sex, sex worker, sex workers, but this modern phrase doesn't always work um, in history either. And I've, I decided on this term because it's, it's a very common uh, phrasing used throughout the documentation that, that I use, and it fits really well the actual experiences of, of women and the conflicts that they have. <clears throat> Um, all of my primary sources come from archival documents, uh, criminal records, um, etc. The accusation of being a public woman could come up in various court settings from divorce cases to marriage objections to the records of the Holy Office to bishops' courts, uh, criminal investigations and trials. A woman would never call herself a public woman, so it's always a label given by someone else, an enemy, um, an aggrieved husband, or an official on some kind of morality campaign. Uh, prostitution does not fit. This is what prostitution is about. This term implies criminal status, and the criminal status comes from 
a judicial judgment of guilty for the direct exchange of a sex act for compensation. So this is how we have these laws now, and the only way to catch a person in these kinds of acts is to, to frame them, right, and prosecute them. This situation did not exist in early modern Spain or its vice royalties. There was no stings or framing of this kind. Uh, being a public woman meant an identity and a moral status. And of course we use the term prostitute, some people might use it as immorality, and generally moral status today as, we're, as well as illegal, but um, it's good to avoid this term in history unless you're quoting a source. Because in fact, selling sex was not a crime. Spanish brothels were legal and government regulated until 1623. So historians have to use um, <clears throat> archival cases related to sex work very carefully um, and really have a good understanding of the gender legal formulas, rhetoric, and expectations. Every woman faced with the accusation of being a public woman denied it. So it takes a little effort to really figure out what the case is about. Admitting to a life of immorality achieved nothing in Spanish uh, secular courts. There, this paternalistic system was designed to reduce every litigant to a petitioner to the crown for its judicial representative. The Spanish crown, here represented by the archive I used, um, was the font of all justice and the source of all patronage. A woman accused of selling sex would be wise to use her court experience to transform herself from an evildoer to a victim of certain enemies or particularly abusive people. Then the accused could have her court case uh, succeed in regaining her moral status and reputation. So historians who don't see the transformative performance of Spanish courts believe the victim tales that are told, despite the complexity of the evidence given as a whole. <clears throat> as a result of this kind of interpretation, women's historic agency disappears. So finding the public women of the Spanish vice royalties challenges a simple story of women as perennial victims by complicating their sexual choices. Carefully reading archival documents offers contradictions to the classic tale, which we're all familiar with. Girlish innocence stolen by some evil influence and a humiliating path to corruption. The needs are either an amazing turnaround of penitence, redemption, and reincorporation into moral society, and there there will always be a strong, paternalistic, upstanding patron to help with that or institutions in time, right? Or a horrible death for recidivists, right? This is the mythology of every story of sex work that you encounter in our society, right? This mythology saturates all narratives. Historical records provide us with the opportunity to retell this story by interpreting gender and sexuality as social and historic forces, um, not biological ubiquities or unquestionable moral laws. So today's talk focuses on the transition that took place in the legal and social interpretations of commercial sex as the Spanish crown expanded its influence into the world, uh, new world in the early modern era. Uh, this is the most difficult time to study this topic. Um, in the medieval era, uh, public women had a recognized status as contributing members of society. <clears throat> uh, they participated openly in religious festivals and also received um, official attention as subject of broth brothel regulations. Uh, so there was no hiding uh, these women in the medieval period. In the 1500s, the le this legal status underwent modification for three reasons. Most importantly, as you can guess, religious reform and a coinciding gradual growth of nations. Of less importance, uh, brothel workers experienced much more regulation, and clandestine non-brothel workers suffered more condemnation due to the spread of syphilis. However, all three factors far from eliminated sex for sale in the early modern period. It simply made it more difficult to trace as um, it became an uh, open secret, not an acknowledged trade. So it had no legal status in effect. Uh, it wasn't until the 18th century and the growth of street level law enforcement that archival records start to offer more information on this topic. So my book project is attempting to span the late medieval period to the murkier early modern period and then ending in the early 1800s, uh, just before independence. Um, when women called prostitutes finally appear more frequently in the surviving criminal documentation. <clears throat> so only a handful of official investigations survived documenting sex for sale in the first century of the Spanish American vice royalties. Mexico City cases that I use today show a continuation of late medieval Iberian understandings with a new world twist. So we have um, three key, key medieval themes to contextualize this um, period. And they come up in three case, case studies that I'll present today. <clears throat> These are from the 1200s to the 1600s, uh, Crown and Municipal Regulation of Legal Brothels, the uh, Mancerias, and the figure of the pimp and law, the first two terms there, or Rufianis and Alcahuelas. 
These dominate the uh, contemporary um, discourse. The importance of these themes come out of the fact that medieval Castile, Aragon, and other European monarchies had a long tradition of regulated legal brothels. These traditions did not cross the Atlantic successfully, and due to the lack of um, large, established, flourishing Spanish-American brothels, sex for sale and vice royalties took a more personal and intimate uh, tone. But this domestic milieu did in no way limit its entrepreneurial nature. So I'll begin by discussing Spain's rich and well-documented history of commercial sex to compensate for the negligible uh, information on brothels and pandering in the early vice royalties. So the laws that most affected um, American vice royalties emerged out of medieval monarchs' efforts to consolidate their authority through propagating legal codes. Um, this started in the second half of the um, 13th century with the Siete Partidas, or the Seven Sections, um, organized by Castilian King Alfonso X. Uh, this put in a place um, the official judicial understanding of pandering. For example, Title 20 of the Siete Partidas breaks down on alcahuetas, the, that's male or female, bods or ruffians, <clears throat> into five categories. And as defined as, so you can think about these definitions are kind of interesting. Um, evil rogues, and, and I'm, I, when I translate these words, I'm simply using this dictionary. Uh, these are all the historic dictionaries um, that do the terms like from, say, 1509 that were used in English. So I'm not making up the English <laughs> translations just to be funny, right? Evil rogues who are whores that are publicly in punteria, uh, taking part of what they earn. Secondly, those that go about as panders for those things seeking them. Thirdly, when men raise in their houses captives or other servants, knowing that they do evil with their bodies. The fourth is a man so vile that he panders his own wife. The fifth is if someone consents that a married or other well-placed woman fornicates in his house for something that she gives him, although he does not go out about procuring for them. The, so these are men or women who the procures. The Siete Partidas says that um, alcahuetas or um, <clears throat> Alcohuetes do great evil by convincing good women to do evil and push those who are just starting to commit errors into becoming much worse. Uh, for punishment, the Siete Partidas says that Alcohuetes, or Alcohuetes should be brought before judges, and if they are proven to be rogues, they should be ejected from the town along with their whores. Men who pander their own wives, other married women, virgins, nuns, or widows with a good reputation deserve the death penalty according to these. Right. Focusing on pimps and progresses, the Siete Partidas do not provide a simple definition for those women whose occupation was sexual commerce. Um, so we don't, there's no law against the remer. Um, the terminology used throughout legal codes, royal decrees, court cases, and witness statements varies widely and is uh, self-contradictory. Some people say the word ramera comes from the word uh, ramo, or branch. Supposedly, a branch is put over a doorway to indicate this is a place where you can go. Um, the first time that I found this word in the dictionaries that are all on this webpage um, uh, scanned in is from Antonio Nebrija's 1495 vocabulary of Spanish and Latin words, which you see is the first, uh, usually the first word there, uh, where Nebrija uh, defines Ramera as a puta honesta, an honest tour, or in Latin, a mer meretrix. Uh, in 1398, the Castilian king Enrique III and the Cortes de Toro um, divided women into juntas públicas, public whores, and called rameras encubiertas, or clandestine prostitutes. Um, at this time, rameras, secret prostitutes, had to pay a larger tax because they were thought to make more money working with a select clientele outside the public world. This classification as women as public and applying sexually accessible to all men versus secret is pretty much the most important distinction in this time period. <clears throat> the Siete Partidas' harsh condemnation of panders and progresses may derive from official preference for regulated brothels. Even before the Christian reconquest, um, licensed sex workers operated in Seville and Cordoba, paying taxes to the Islamic rulers uh, at that time. From approximately 1300 until the late 16th century, regulated legal brothels flourished throughout the re-Christianized um, Iberian Peninsula, from Barcelona to Granada. Iberian monarchs viewed brothels as an excellent opportunity for several moral, financial, and political reasons. Uh, brothels theoretically enclosed male violence and competitiveness in a bounded area. 
brothel regulations stipulated that no men, uh, that men had to surrender their weapons upon entering, <clears throat> and thus this space served as a possible deterrent to street, street battles. <clears throat> Politically, the grant of a brothel license to a particular individual um, helped unstable or contested monarchs facing many powerful opponents reward those subjects who served them loyally. Those who received monopolistic access to the bounteous brothel revenue could hand down this privilege to their heirs, and thus the recipients of these privileges jealously guarded this uh, institution as legal. For example, there was a famous character in the 1400s called um, the whoremonger, Alonzo Yanis Harlow, and he received enormous benefits from an enormous royal grant to the brothel monopoly for many, many cities, uh, including Granada, six years before it was even conquered by the Catholic kings, so they had anticipated how important this was going to be. Financially, legalizing only one official brothel in each town or city created opportunities for a huge income and fines, even beyond the steady tax incomes that they generated as successful businesses. So they could collect fines on any infinitesimal infraction against the strict brothel regulations, and these funded many public offices and the courts themselves. They were constantly trying cases and funding themselves for these. So overall, semi-legal sex, sex work allowed late medieval and early modern Iberian authorities to attain the perfect balance between an apparently benign paternalistic state tolerance and the possibility of harsh enforcement of laws at any whim. Um, legal brothels extended the reach of both Iberian monarchs and town governments and made them stronger, helped them consolidate their authority. And that's why it's strange that the Spanish crown chose not to extend this institution to the New World where they were, you know, you'd think, trying to uh, extend their authority. Despite the tradition of philosophical and theological writings that encourage humans to control their baser passions and the view of sexuality as an opposing force to spirituality, in medieval and early modern Iberia, the general population, church and state, voiced a discourse of brothels as a public good. As such, clients had to receive these services at a reasonable fee. Um, this society viewed non-monogamous sex as a right that all men should have, a benefit for everyone, men, women, and children, not a luxury for the privilege. Brothels made their large profits for the residents, uh, not for the residents, but for their managers, the monarchs, and the municipalities that later received the revenue. Uh, for many centuries, it's well documented that the average Spaniard um, rejected the concept that simple fornication between two consenting adults was a moral wrong, despite Christian and later Catholic attempts to enforce this ideology. Uh, especially later on after the um, Counter-Reformation with the Immaculate Conception, which people just couldn't get behind. It was a very difficult <laughs> campaign. And there's many, a lot of evidence uh, from Inquisition cases and what have you that the common man logically questioned, why would the king license brothels if there was something wrong with uh, no strings attached sex? They just didn't get it. Um, even women, this, I don't know if this story is apocryphal, but it comes from an Inquisition case, so even women who, a uh, woman who testified about her husband, describing her husband, uh, as a, uh, she seemed open-minded. Apparently, one late medieval wife described her husband with great love and affection, noting that other than the fact that era putenero mucho de mujeres, which I mostly <laughs> translate, he was a real whorehound, <laughs> he was as good and pious as St. Francis. And she wanted to lay beside him for eternity in a journey. What was it like for a man to visit a legal brothel in medieval or early modern Iberia? Uh, different descriptions survive from male visitors, and I'm sure you can imagine, especially for the highly successful Valencia in La Sevilla. Um, giving the 21st century the reader, uh, reader an impression of a pleasurable outing that promised or illusion of a fantasy world of sex operating under uh, fully legal conditions with very strict rules, uh, much like today's strip clubs. It's an illusion. Danger. Most brothels, including Valencia's, operated on the edge or just outside of an urban settlement. Uh, actually, I can show that. Uh, in Valencia, the brothel was a small wall. This is not Valencia. A small wall village enclosing two or three uh, hundred women working out of rooms organized along three or four streets. Men entered the brothel via one entrance only, interacting with a guard. The guard would ask men to surrender their weapons and even promise to safely watch over their cash. Once inside the brothel, men observed and admired beautifully dressed, elegant women sitting under bright lanterns in front of their rooms so they could enter taverns and inns. Spending time with the residents had a fixed standard cost. 
In Seville, municipal officials uh, rented out simple huts near the Guadalquivir River, which you can see here, and these cluster dwellings functioned as a brothel, and the town took care over the uh, decades to repair and maintain these buildings. How did women experience life in the legal brothel? Well, that's very hard to know. Um, we only know a few details from a female point of view beyond the regulations, which are everywhere. Women who worked in brothels were supposed to be officially registered by giving um, name, age, parents, and place of origin to municipal authorities. Every brothel worker, of course, had an alias, just like today, um, that she provided in the registration process. These women had to be non-locals and non-noble women over age 20. They paid fees to the brothel managers, but received linens, clothing, and housing in return. <clears throat> Most historians view brothel work as a desperate recourse for poor, transient women, victimized by the countless natural man-made disasters of the male-dominated era. But one interesting quote from King Philip II um, noted in frustration that many brothel women illegally left their place of work uh, in the evenings to live in their, quote, palaces, where they met with male clients and acted as if they were honorable women. <clears throat> Apparently, some public women had the economic survival skills to make selling sex an entrepreneurial venture. <clears throat> Through legalizing and regulating brothels, Iberian monarchs and municipal governments <clears throat> hoped to impose centralized control over the endemic violence in their society. Iberia was a place full of frequent internal conflicts, independent warlords, and very busy ports full of transient men. Monarchs spent decades trying to tamp down the power of nobles who dominate both the cities and the countryside. These nobles gathered delinquents, ruffians, and rogues around them as their own personal bodyguard or entourage and encouraged them to foment urban disorder. The grandees, <clears throat> objecting to the monarchs' efforts to centralize power, willingly protected these evildoers from nation crowd justice. Ruffians roamed the streets provoking brawls with little fear of judicial retribution because those in charge of prosecuting them were the exact same people who protected the lawbreakers. Ruffians faced severe penalties um, for, for being pimps. For the purposes of controlling street fighting, criminal vagabonds, and local strongmen, it seems logical that the Crown would want brothels in their vice royalties, but they didn't. The American experience of epidemics in the first centuries of contact is one of the only things that I can really figure out, which prevented um, uh, official brothels. Because in the old world, municipalities began founding hospitals um, targeting syphilitics by the early 16th century. After the brothels and the towns and charities they funded enjoyed their greatest prosperity in the mid um, 16th century, syphilis outbreaks led Philip II to decree more brothel regulations in 1570. So, on some kind of regular basis, brothel workers endured uh, periodic medical inspections and had to leave the brothel for treatment if doctors found any trace of the pox. Despite the fact that Philip's 1570 reforms warned against clandestinas as destructive disease vectors, the vice royalties never took part in these kinds of inspections. <clears throat> in Iberia, ruffians found many female collaborators despite the existence of uh, legal brothels and the serious punishments threatened by Crown Justice. The opportunities for non brothel clandestinas unfolded in the Spanish vice royalties. So, this is my image on uh, following um, centuries-old peninsular patterns of illegal prostitution outside of the brothels. So outside the brothels, uh, around them, there were many taverns and inns. These places employed female servants, um, jobs taken on by clandestinas. In these locations, men, including the innkeepers themselves, illegally pimped out one or several female servants who could host clients in, in the inn's rooms. A lesser number uh, had female pimps, and these things these facts are all proven by criminal cases because this was all illegal. This stuff is illegal. Um, <clears throat> but women could have female types or work for their own husbands. Since non-Christian men rented the legal brothels, took a very serious risk in doing that, that was another huge market for the um, clandestinas. In some cases, uh, cruel slurs captured in documents suggest that the clandestine um, women were too old dirty, sick, ugly, or all of the above to work in a public brothel. But in fact, it's an interesting note that if you were too scandalous or too loud, you had to leave the public brothel. So that's kind of a contradiction to a stereotype, right? And, and some clandestinas offer their potential clients the opposite end of the spectrum. Discretion, secrecy, exclusivity, wealth, social prominence, and sophistication. Of course, no one could force a a uh, clandestine sex worker to have a venereal disease inspection, but this didn't seem to bother their patrons. Um, some honorable courtly men even bragged about their so-called bubas, rejecting any notion of shame for what the 
clerics would say, is divine punishment for their sin. Um, these attitudes suggest a male disregard for catching venereal disease and pride in the badges of libertine life. <clears throat> so rich and poor clandestinas operated from the beginning of settlement in the vice royalties and avoided the um, detested pimp or ruffian or relied on their own schemes for the um, work of a bod or not quite This character, the procuress, has a much more complex and even sympathetic history than the much uh, maligned, uh, universally hated pimp. Law codes, including the Siete Partidas, said they would be harshly punished, right? But many classics of Castilian literature humanize this figure. From before the Christian reconquest of Spain, treatises acknowledged the role, uh, essential role of the Bod, and, and of course you can see it was an um, Arabic word, right? <clears throat> the role of the Bod for setting up illicit uh, liaisons. Medieval Andalusian culture accepted the fact that no affairs could happen without a third party involved. All illicit encounters were at least love triangles, if not some larger sided shape. <laughs> the fact that women lived separately socially from men did not stand in the way of sexual encounters. Right? Um, but this led to the necessity of a skilled and subtle mediator, mediator and witty verbal interlocutor to bridge gender communication gaps, the fact that people were separate. In this tradition, both the bot and the female lover cooperated to entrap a man and do the, her husband, showing off their intelligence and sophistication. To have the skill to move in men's and women's world, the Ba had to possess the wisdom of age and a desire to organize other people's trysts. So what happened when these things came to the New World? A few scattered pieces of evidence show that the Spanish crown tried to extend the policy of licensing brothels from Spain <clears throat> to its territories in the New World. And that. In 1526, um, the Spanish crown licensed Bartolomeu Conejo to found a royal brothel or uh, Casa de Mujeres Públicas <clears throat> uh, in San Juan, Puerto Rico. The license stated that this foundation was necessary to avoid inconveniences. <clears throat> uh, similar arrangement was made in 1538. By, uh, uh, sorry, in Santo Domingo. <clears throat> By 1538, a house of Manzanilla existed in uh, Mexico City. Very little evidence survives for this uh, institution. Apparently, it had disappeared by 1587. So legal brothels did not flourish, or they gave very little evidence of their existence. Possibly clerical forces prevented this, or maybe they just couldn't enforce the regulations, and it seemed kind of pointless to even bother doing it. <clears throat> maybe the judicial authorities just couldn't be bothered to prosecute anybody. Um, so uh, clandestinas, pimps, bods, completely took over the trade in sex. Without regulation, as we know, illegal, illicit transactions will always boom. Even in this era, major Spanish-American cities probably hosted women on the street, women working in taverns, um, uh, working out of humble accommodations um, with a pimp or a madam. Um, and uh, without an official brothel, then every act of, a sexual, of sexual commerce was, was, in theory, clandestine by the European system. So men and women could oversee their servants and family members, rent out rooms, um, and procure clients for independent workers. Spanish, Indian, and Costa women worked out of unofficial brothels, taverns, pulquerias, gaming houses, public baths, temescales, which are the um, steep indigenous baths, and luxurious rooms. Uh, Philip II imposed new harsher punishments on um, <clears throat> pimps in a 1566 decree. The king commanded that husbands who consented to their wives, quote, doing evil with their bodies for money, should receive the same harsh punishments as did any other ruffian. Public shaming on the first offense, plus 10 years rowing in the royal galleys. So this is what this says. Vergüenza pública, 10 años del servicio en las galeras, without pay, right? So that's what this guy is, and he was actually able to appeal this punishment. Uh, because he had a failing. So that was the worst punishment you could get. For a second offense, uh, 100 lashes and a perpetual sentence of galley slavery, right? Which is obviously only going to last a few years anyways. Um, so this is how much they hated the male camp, right? So I think that these decrees from on high in the 1560s and 70s is the reason why we have a couple of cases that exist in the vice world because we're in this time period. So I'll turn to my um, cases now for Mexico City. <clears throat> Challenges to conventional understandings of 
honor and family life emerge from the 1570s trials of two men accused of menocinio, or procuring their own wives for other men. Uh, another term that they use is consentidor, implying that these men consented to or benefited from these um, affairs. Now, these acts seem completely impossible when we think about the honor code uh, based on sexual inaccessibility of women uh, who are married or have any male relatives. So women who are protected by men are supposed to be private women, not public. But these men that we're going to talk about were um, ruffians, right, consenting to this situation. So in the first case, we have um, an interesting uh, couple who redeemed their shared honor through statements made by their characteristic witnesses in a court. <clears throat> the court. The court case was able to, uh, the defense was able to present the accused ruffian as a man who worried about his wife's honor, not a panderer. So this achieved the ultimate goal of court cases, which was to reformulate or transform a bad reputation into a good one via the accusations. So this case is about a man called Antonio Tenino, age 25, who allegedly allowed his wife of four years, Maria de Isa, age 19, to have um, sex with other men for pay, according to a 1571 uh, investigation by the bishop's court. A witness testimony indicates that Antonio sounds like a pimp, bringing to life why uh, this class was so hated. Um, according to witnesses, everyone in the neighborhood, uh, hostile witnesses, everyone in their neighborhood knew that Antonio took Maria to a tavern uh, late at night, and they returned drunk. While there, he arranged for her to have sex for pay with different men, some of whom had open access to the couple's house. A witness stated that the tavern keeper gave Antonio a quartilla of wine during these negotiations, and he took it with him and left the tavern. This venue from Maria's trade is very similar to what we uh, talked about for, uh, for Spain, outside of the legal brothel. Witnesses spoke of at least four different men who they had witnessed paying for carnal access, with Maria with the full knowledge and consent of her husband. A fellow prisoner in the Archbishop's jail claimed he heard a revealing conversation between the husband and wife. Allegedly, Maria, in a drunken rave, called Antonio a knave, a great scoundrel, and a cuckold because you sent me to earn off my body so you would have some money. And that's in the first line. De Iaco, bien de laco, cornudo, cornudo, porque me atca, que me enviaba de ganar con mi cuerpo. First two lines. Antonio responded in kind, saying that Maria lied. So obviously this word bayak is like really, really bad word in those days. <laughs> they translated it as rogue or it doesn't come off, but I, I think it was far worse, right? So this is the kind of evidence that was against them. Uh, it seemed that Antonio was a hustler, but they, uh, the spouses denied this. They said they were honorable people, good Christians, denied any uh, illicit sexual reputations. And this is how every single case works. Every single person on the defense denies <coughs> everything. <clears throat> and they, they use this opportunity to redeem their reputation uh, by not letting a single aspect of the accusation pass without denouncing them. Self-asserting their moral character is the essential task in these uh, cases. Antonio understood this well, so after a month in jail, he made petitions asking why they were in jail, why he had a thick chain and irons on his legs. As we understand his denials is a rhetorical stance and trust these hostile witnesses, as the court did, this harsh punishment makes a lot of sense because he was a ruffian. Um, despite the claims made by hostile witnesses, Antonio could find 10 plebeian uh, mature men, the age is important, who were willing to deny that he consented to his wife having sex with other men. The evidence is quite interesting, though. Antonio was a ruffian, clearly. He had witnesses craft an honorable character, character for him, but usually he, he was a thug. One witness affirmed that Antonio would never allow his wife to associate with dishonorable people. So far, so good, right? Uh, several witnesses stated that it was unlikely that such a suspicious and jealous man would allow his wife to have sex with other men. But Antonio's jealousy extended to frequently beating Maria, according to six male witnesses, so much so that Maria appeared with a bloody face and feared for her life. One witness said he'd stepped in to try to save her. The court testimonies helpfully shaped Maria to a victim, not a woman for sale. This is the best way to do it when you're on trial, right? Um, this trial made Maria a good woman, and she was her husband's victim. The witnesses expressed the opinion that making an income, income off of procuring did not uh, suit a jealous, violent husband, and the character they created sounds like a, the ideal ruffian, I, I think. Um, the, the court was not convinced that he was a good husband. 
Uh, Maria apparently received no sentence, and she probably got out of jail pretty soon, given that at this time she wasn't committing any crime. Uh, there was no legal brothel uh, really flourishing, so she wasn't disregarding any brothel regulations by doing this. Um, there were no laws against her. But procuring was punishable, and consenting to other men having sex with one's wife was strong grounds for divorce, if not um, serious punishments have you seen. And remember, the punishments were 10 years as a galley slave. Um, and even those who spoke in Antonio's favor suggested that he deserved a, a penance. So this is the bishop's court. So all they can sentence him to is a mass on foot, carrying a candle, and banishment for two years, and an admonishment to be a better husband. So you can see that they didn't even care to enforce the secular justice that was on the book that the king had just uh, told him to <clears throat> do, right? So potential list of lovers in 16th century Mexico City also had the option of calling on a female god. And then we have the case of 1570 of a woman called Catalina Garcia, who also came before the bishop's court um, for helping organize her friend. And so these are fictional pictures, right? This is by um, Murillo, a civilian painter. Uh, so. But there's no knowing what this is, but we're just saying it's what we're describing. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not confirmed. Right? Both Catalina and Maria came from a plebeian Spanish background, but Catalina, <laughs> at age 38, had 12 more years of life experience than Maria, a, slight, a slightly higher so, social status, because the older woman had a tradesman husband, and she could write and sign her name. And she might have even done her own petitions. <clears throat> Catalina's M.O. Drew, drew from the ancient Alcapueta traditions of the Spanish front to New Spain. Catalina knew how to convince her clients with words. She was persistent and aggressive. She masterminded locations for lovers to meet. Uh, she got compensation for arranging these affairs. Um, she was called an Alcapueta, quote, for fornicating men and women, an encubridora, a tercera, an accessory to fornication and a mediator. <clears throat> uh, Catalina knew how to use the legal formulas to protect and conserve her good reputation against these accusations. According to Maria, the younger woman, and three of her lovers, Catalina aggressively solicited these men as they innocently strolled past her house at various hours of the night and day. Catalina called to them from the window. Here's another way you can look at it, also by Maria. And on occasion, um, so with, with Maria, she stood at the window or the door. They targeted men uh, aged 20, 26, and 30. These were plebeian men. Uh, one described as a mestizo and the other was a tailor. <clears throat> in classic Alcohueta style, allegedly Catalina ignored all their hesitation over engaging in um, excesso carnal with Maria and convinced the four potential fornicators to submit with their persuasive verbiage. When Maria first refused to have sex with the men, Catalina asked her over and over again, promising that each man would, quote, do very well for her. Catalina spoke to the men, convinced them instantly over, four, over a few days to meet with Maria at their house, or um, at, at the men's house. <clears throat> so the witnesses in this case were actually incriminating themselves, but not for a serious crime, because simple fornication between uh, married adults was, was not a, a crime at this time. As an alleged Bob, Catalina had the most to fear. The clerical court talk, took these accusations very seriously, and she was put in jail. When questioned directly about the pandering Maria and her lovers had narrated, Catalina denied everything other than the fact that Maria had lived with her um, because she was sick. Catalina built her own case by cementing the superb reputation as an honest married woman while tearing down the trustworthiness of her um, accuser and her lovers. <clears throat> According to Catalina, Maria's accusations had no value because she was a public whore of Jamera. Uh, Somewhere on there. <laughs> um, it says that. Uh, you can see the word encubridora, de pecados cardinales, right? So this is her petition that uh, accused um, Alcahueta. And let's see. Uh, Mujer Publica Ramera, right? <clears throat> who slept with many men for money. <clears throat> So with no legal brothel in the city, uh, this was really all that Maria could do uh, is work independently, and it was not an illegal occupation, although it made her somewhat of a weak witness. Catalina denied any responsibility for pandering her friend or controlling her actions. Maria, the um, woman making the accusations, was over 25, unmarried, had appeared to have no father, uncle, brother, or other male relative in the area who could stand up for her honor. Um, Catalina said, um, Maria was a free woman who 
prepared me to like, go, go out at night however she wants to. She could do whatever she wanted at night. She's a free woman. What's, you know, who cares, right? Interesting attitude, right? Um, Catalina's witnesses were a group of young Spanish men who appeared to be um, her close friends and often visited her house. They said she had a very good character. Um, she was a good Christian. She lived reclusively. In contrast, Maria uh, walked the streets alone at night and they called her a puta. She sold her body to anybody and everybody who would pay. Um, she wasn't selective, so she didn't need a bod. Her, her, because uh, of her sexual lack of uh, selectivity, she didn't need a mediator. She took the initiative. She didn't require persuading communication arts of a bod. So these people understood in Alcohuetas, um, in the old world tradition, subtle, sophisticated go-betweens for discreet lovers, not crass, high-volume pimps. Although I find it interesting that all their witnesses are young Spanish men who seem very willing to stand up for her, and these would be ideal clients if she were a successful lawyer, right? Ideal associates. So um, we don't know what happened at the end of this case, but it's clear that the idea of an alcohueta is very well known amongst the people who are testifying. So surviving cases show that without a brothel, uh, people, male residents of Mexico City could participate in sex for sale. They could seek out a woman who procured their servants or even their daughters in a domestic setting. These were informal family brothels. They could go to taverns looking for women who had ruffians in exchange, uh, who took money in exchange for sex with their women. Um, this could result in violent encounters with violent men like Antonio Temino. They could look out for women like Catalina uh, who would call them and say, I've got something you might be interested in, right? Or they could look for women like Maria who just walked out on the streets alone. Uh, this is not a very exclusive approach. Um, it's sort of like the legal brothels in Spain, not very discriminating. Plebeian, all the clientele mentioned is plebeian. Um, they don't, this doesn't leave a lot of historical evidence because it wasn't of interest to the, to the authorities in these days. Um, other men chose the more um, well-known path of the servant-master relationship. This arrangement was not, um, on this slide, was not a problem for most people uh, including the authorities, unless it caused a scandal. <clears throat> um, so there was another case, uh, my last case, is uh, the Arch another Archbishop's Court case from 1577, when a married couple called Martín de Villasola and Juana Rodriguez um, caused a problem because they openly ignored a previous sentence that was given to the husband of banishment. They stuck in Mexico City, scandalously continuing their open polyamorous love triangles that sometimes seem to even be love squares and beyond. According um, to the neighbors, Martine encouraged one to entertain at least three different men in their house, serving them meals, washing their clothes, and having physical contact with them on a regular basis for an extended period of time. So I just put this uh, woman's picture up. This is the closest thing I could have to this kind of thing. <clears throat> Uh, Juana's lovers included a cleric, a notary, and a blacksmith um, who were all good earners who could afford to compensate the couple for Juana's attention. The first two men, a cleric and a notary, were very useful and powerful allies in their criminal trials. So witnesses claimed to see Martine asking the men for money. Um, they also provided the simple luxuries of um, uh, paying for meat and chicken for their meals. Um, Despite the money exchanged with um, Juana's husband, the accusation did not mention that Juana was a public woman, woman or use any other negative terms, uh, judging her morally. Instead, the testimonies focused on the details that showed an intimate connection between Juana and her lovers, and how her husband, quote, consented to his wife's carnal access and communication with different men for pay. The witnesses spoke of her as an ansegada or the concubine of her visitors. Her husband, in this case, doesn't appear to be a ruffian. Um, and that these terms are not used. He instead seems to be more like a genteel male law, a sociable man disinterested in honor and marital fidelity. <clears throat> of course, we don't hear his statements in this case, unfortunately, but they probably be all denials, right? Prior neighbors claimed they saw very intimate scenes between Juana and especially and her lover, who's the blacksmith of dogs. The lovers often left their door open all the time, allowing their neighbors to look inside, including especially two children of 13 and 14 who did a lot of spying on them. Uh, they knew that Juana openly committed adultery with the consent of her husband, which they proved by reports of their uh, loving gestures. The neighbors claimed that Orgaz often stayed with Juana alone in the evening, in various states of undress, with no shoes on or even barefoot, a clear sign of informality and intimacy in, in this day and age. 
Neighbors alleged that Orgaz, the blacksmith, would lay in one bed with one where a husband slept in another in the same room, even with their son present. Reportedly, one man hosted the married couple, the lover of Oz, and another woman on a, a fiesta holiday day, and the group ate together. While Oz and Juana touched each other openly in front of her husband, he allegedly lay propped up and surrounded by her voluminous skirts while Juana combed and cleaned the dandruff out of his hair. This is a typical uh, sign of um, intimacy, right? Uh, that kind of thing. Another witness claimed that once, while chatting with the husband in the couple's doorway at 3 p.m., he saw the notary lover enter the house, eating a walnut. When Juana entered, the notary began embracing and hugging, hugging her, and he put the walnut in her mouth, with his mouth. The lovers then sat down together intimately. The notary was heard to write that Juana was his concubine and praised her for her buenas carnes, which I guess is as close as you can say to have. She had a good body. Right? <laughs> nice flesh, right? The uh, neighbor spied on and reported these non-monogamous scenes in response um, to the investigation that uh, Martina totally disregarded his banishment. Uh, which again, remember, he only got a banishment, which was way less than his uh, supposed punishment. Everyone involved seemed unconcerned about secular and religious authorities, monogamy within marriage, sin, and even the laws against pandering. And even the lovers were the uh, represented church and state. They were a cleric and a notary. Um, they didn't seem to worry about honor uh, within a marriage. Um, they did get a little scared when the second investigation started, especially the blacksmith, uh, Hernando Ogas, who was uh, worried about this ignoring of the banishment and the spying neighbors. Allegedly, the husband, Martin, told Ogas, don't worry, even though these rogues will try to disturb him, he should always, quote, come to my house and enjoy yourself with me and my woman. Although at times he flaunted his public displays of affection, at other times Ogas feared detection. He wanted to still visit Juana, so he came incognito late at night, dressed in the abito de indio, he wore an indigenous costume. Very weird uh, style. The affectionate, open relationship, uh, relationships between this married woman and her lovers defy explanations based on standard understandings of honor, sexuality, and the family at this time. Martina and Juana force us to consider that perhaps not all married couples worry about monogamy. William Reddy um, persuasively argues that what many now view as an unbreakable link between love and sexual exclusivity in Western culture, that our love for one person elevates sexual desires to a higher plane, making them uh, not instincts or animalistic anymore, that this concept may have emerged as a quiet rebellion against medieval church reforms promoting chastity. Several other historic world civilizations have taken a completely different approach to sensuality and sex without creating an opposing and rarefied concept of the spiritual. The cases discussed today suggest that many Spanish Americans and, and, and Spaniards themselves in the old world also understood sex very differently from what priests preached and what was written in theological treatises or confession manuals that they had to hear when they went to confession. Although very difficult to trace, the history of public women offers us rare insights into women's opinions and experiences of their intimate life and how they shaped it to survive under social and political movement.